Gun violence is a major issue in the United States. And while the issue is a balance between gun rights and public health, anyone who frames the debate as a guns or no guns is creating a false dichotomy. We can preserve public health without completely banishing guns, but we need good research to guide us. And that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. <laughs> Between 2009 and 2017, there were over 85,000 firearm-related injuries and over 34,000 firearm-related deaths in the United States. For a long time, car accidents were the leading cause of death among U.S. children. In 2020, that was replaced by guns. We aren't here to debate the politics. We're here to talk about this from a public health perspective. Dr. Megan Ranney from Brown University has pointed out that while American public health suffers from gun violence, we don't approach it as a public health issue. When we're looking to reduce car crash-related deaths, we don't devolve into two camps with one side advocating for getting rid of all cars altogether and the other side advocating for all cars to be available to anyone and everyone without rules or requirements. Instead, we create licensing requirements, seatbelt laws, and various other safety standards and restrictions. As Dr. Ranny puts it, we decreased car crash deaths drastically through a combination of education, engineering, and policy we should be approaching firearm deaths in a similar manner. In a similar vein, I've said countless times before that we're never going to get to COVID zero and that people framing it that way are being unrealistic. We have to take measures to make things much safer, but it was never gonna work to approach COVID prevention with an all or nothing attitude. The same principles apply here. We can't come at this from a no guns ever or all guns all the time perspective. There's a middle ground where we can save a lot of lives. Major space in that middle ground is gun storage. We did an episode on this back in 2019. Even a modest increase in owners locking up their guns would result in a pretty large decrease in firearm-related deaths, both suicides and homicides. As we reported in that video, about a third of households owned at least one gun in 2015, and more than 20% of households with both guns and children at home reported storing them loaded and unlocked. Another 50% reported storing them either loaded or unlocked. Another important space in that middle ground is community investment in mental health services. Over 80% of mass shooters were in a noticeable crisis years, months, weeks, or days before their shooting. Though we should note here that mass shootings are not the main source of firearm-related deaths. And according to Dr. Rani, feeling isolated is one of the biggest predictors of violence. And while we need to focus a lot more attention on all the factors associated with and leading up to incidents of gun violence, legislation will obviously come into play. In another episode of Healthcare Triage, we aired in 2017, we covered the kind of gun laws that do work. Restricting, not banning purchase, access and use of firearms is associated with a reduction in firearm-related deaths. Reducing the number of days people could carry firearms in Colombia reduced the number of homicides. In Australia, things like restrictions on certain firearms, mandated background checks, and waiting periods were associated with considerable reductions in firearm homicides and suicides. In the United States, more comprehensive background checks were associated with fewer firearm deaths. More comprehensive checks include taking into account things like restraining orders and mental illness. When Missouri repealed its requirement that purchasers have a license before purchasing a handgun and must therefore be subjected to background checks by licensed dealers, firearm homicide rates increased by 25% in the period after the repeal. Now, there are the usual caveats. Data from some countries, like Canada, are mixed, and studies are looking at associations, etc. We also completely understand that gun legislation will not stop gun deaths entirely. But doing nothing because we can't do everything just doesn't make sense. If we can take measures to reduce gun violence and death, we should. And we should let ourselves be guided by research when making those decisions. This means that we'll need to invest in more research to understand the nuances of different approaches at both the local and national level. What we don't need are distractions about false choices that lead to inaction. This is not a one or the other situation. Like we've said in previous episodes, solutions for this issue in the United States will need to respect the rights of gun owners while protecting the lives of all Americans. We can only do that if we invest in research on both gun legislation and factors associated with gun violence, and then invest in solutions that pay respect to community norms and include everyone in the conversation. 
Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode on which kind of gun laws work. And you could even go on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage and help us make more in-depth series like those. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Edward Lillahome, and Brian Nam, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam. <laughs>